Good Friday morning, Market Chameleons, and everyone joining us for the first time. Thanks for coming by and checking out the Market Chameleon pre-market show with the main man, Dimitri Pargamonic. How you doing, D? Hey, well, how's it going? Great. You want to start with the disclaimer? It's up there for everyone to uh, look at. Yep. So good morning, everyone. Before we get started, keep in mind, Will and I, Market Chameleon, we're not a registered investment advisor. We're not a broker dealer. We're not telling you what to do. We're just sharing ideas. If you need professional advice, call your registered investment advisor, call your broker. That's what they're there for, to give you advice, provide you with guidance. There's the disclaimer. Perfect. So what's going on in the pre-market this morning? Yep. And let me share my screen. If you guys have any questions, today's Q&A day. If you have any questions, put those questions in the live chat. Will's watching it. He'll read them back to me. If you want to come on a show and ask your question live, we also put out a link to Zoom. Click on that link. It takes you over to Zoom. When you get to Zoom, click on raise your hand. You don't have to turn on your video camera, but you, we will. everybody will be able to hear you. Um, those are two ways to ask questions. And while we're waiting for any questions to come in, we'll, I'll start out with the pre-market report. Um, uh, maybe take a look at some things that that have been coming over the email, some questions that, that I typically get. And if I get questions that I think are recurring, you know, I bring them up on the show. Perfect. Of course, if somebody has a question, stop me, Will, and I'll take those. All right. Um, Sounds good. So let's start out with the pre-market report. And these are stocks trading in the pre-market hours. We have our most active list, biggest percentage gainers, biggest percentage decliners, down here, I see 197 stocks made our percentage gainers list, 40 on a percentage decliners. So from this perspective right now, we're, we're looking like we're setting up for a bullish bias at the open. I'm going to filter out this list to look at just stocks that are in the S&P 500. Um, so we're taking out low cap stocks, closed end funds, ETFs, leveraged products, preferred stocks, all those things we're going to remove and we're just going to look at S&P 500 companies. To do that, I'm going to use the filters here um, and this filter in ETF, I'm going to drop it down. There are a list of ETFs in here. By selecting the ETF, I'm going to filter out the, the uh, stocks that are holdings in that ETF. Okay, so SPY, that's the S&P 500 ETF. Now this list got filtered out by the stocks that are holdings in that ETF, which are the S&P 500 constituents. And here we see 36 stocks made our percentage gainers list, one on the decliners. So, so far that looks like a bullish bias at the open. Um, and this is, I think would be what the second day we're rallying in a row. Yeah, it seems like it's a rally into the end of the week, that's for sure. Yep, yep. So selling off a lot of volatility right now, um, back and forth, certainly oil prices coming down. That's a good thing for, has been positive for inflation. So there are some, uh, we see some easing and pressure on, on the, on the inflation part. Um, that's given some confidence to the market there. And if you listen to the fed, you know, I read it, when I listened and read some of the fed, um, speeches, you know, I get different interpretation of what you hear in the headlines. Um, you know, they're saying that they're very hawkish and, and they're on, but I don't know, to me, it seems like their tone is they do a lot of acknowledgements that, you know, that they're easing pressures on the inflation front, that, that they're seeing weaknesses in the economy you know, they do add, but we're very serious about fighting inflation, getting down to that 2%. But, you know, at least when I, when I read their speeches versus what you read in the papers, it sounds a lot different. What do you think, Will? It, I mean, it seems to be certainly being debated in the papers whether the Fed, Fed is going to be as hawkish as they're saying, which yeah. means to me that the people are fighting the Fed you know, in, in the marketplace, right? Where that yeah. didn't ha that no one was doing that on the way up. 
Uh, right. So with interest rates moving higher, where's the market? It seems to me needs to go lower, though I'm not giving any advice. But, you know, right. Right. I mean, I think Janet Yellen gave a speech yesterday and she seems to. But, you know, she, you know, she also at first made the mistake thinking that that the inflation was just going to go away. It was transitory. Yeah, it was transitory. So she's a little careful. Huh? It was the entire Fed was that way, too. I don't yeah, know the administration. Yeah, they're, they're all on board. So they're being they're being careful. But sometimes, you know, I, what, what I'm reading is, you know, they they're making a lot of um acknowledgments hey you know we're seeing pressures easing especially in the interest rate sensitive sector like housing they're they're saying that the difference between the ppi and cpi so there's a their modern term inflation from the producer price index versus the consumer price index so they're looking at it as the margins and those margins are growing um you know jenny young was think yesterday was indicating she thinks that that um, that there's going to be a softening in the market in the automobile sector because they see the differences between what it costs them to produce and what they're selling that there's very high margins right now that spreads good so a couple of things there maybe that they are indicating that they might be you know looking at slowing down that rate of rate of increases maybe that's what the market is picking up on um if you carefully read it uh you know but they're they're also i think this in september they've increased the runoff in those in their on their balance sheet so they're not buying any more treasure they're not selling treasuries but what's happening is that they're not rolling any treasuries that come to maturity so so, you know, there's a significant amount because they they would always roll it, you know, when when they matured, they'll go out and buy more. Now they've reduced that to to, uh, you know, lower their balance sheet. Um, so that I think started this month in September. So we'll see how that goes. But to just to put things in, I, I, I and I don't think they're going to stop raising interest rate just yet. You know, I think September they are going to raise interest rates but um what i might do is display let me use goldman's maybe i'll use goldman sachs as an example um i wanted to show you know when you raise the cost of capital um it could have a significant impact on a valuation of a risk asset okay so Maybe think of it this way, you know, if you, I'll give you an extreme example, you know, if you value a piece of real estate as, you know, how much, how much rent does it pay and what return do I demand? So let's just say that you could collect $10,000 in rent on an investment property. And if you demand 10% return, then you're willing to pay $100,000 for that property or less, right? But you need at least a 10% return to take that risk in that particular property. Um, and let's say I go to a very extreme and all of a sudden you're like, you know what? Things got a lot riskier, you know, um, and I need a 20% return, right? So now I went from 10% return, I'm demanding a 20% return. So I'm no longer willing to pay $100,000 for it. Now I'm only willing to pay $50,000 for the same exact property with the same exact amount of rent. And that's only because your the, the rate of return that you're demanding went up, right? And the rate of return, that that's an extreme example, obviously, because I just doubled it. But just to show you how, how that asset price can move just by that, just by you demanding a higher rate of return. And that's what caused when you're raising the risk-free rate, right? The more you're raising the risk-free rate, the higher the return you're gonna have, have to demand because there's no point of you 
investing in a risk asset and earning the same return as you would in a riskless asset, right? Because then you're all you're doing is taking risk for no no reward. Um, so let's go over maybe an example. So a gr a good example would be if you took really the uh, discounted cash flow model, but I don't have it up there yet. Um, but discounted cash flow model, think of it as you're projecting future uh, free cash flows that the company will generate. And then based on those future free cash flows, you're taking the present value of it to see what am I willing to pay? Just like the rent example. So the rent example, I. I made it that the rent would be constant every year, but we know that earnings and rents go up over time, right? So, so you would have to project what I think it's going to go up over time and then discount it back. So I'm going to use the next thing that I do have is a dividend discount model. Okay. And this is a simpler model and it basically treats dividends that way and says, forget about the earnings, I'm just interested in the dividends. So, the, so it only really works in, in companies that you know, pay dividends, you know, take a lot of their earnings, pay dividends, and then grow their dividends over time. So I'm gonna use Goldman Sachs as an example because it's a big bank stock, usually they trade near their book value anyway. Um, but for this demonstration, let's go over the dividend discount model. Then I'm going to raise the, the required return by 1% just to show you how much the valuation of that stock declines based on you needing an extra 1% rate of return per year. Okay. So to set this up here right now, the our required rate of return is just defaulted to 10%. And, you know, there, there is, and it's really what you require with, for your investment. If you think, you know, in, in this stock, based on the risk I'm taking, I require a 10% return year over year, okay? Usually fluctuate between six and 14%. There is a formula people use, weighted average cost of capital, there are assumptions in there and you calculate beta and stuff like that. But we just default to 10%, leave it up to you. Um, but Goldman Sachs, it's a more established company. You know, it's been around for a long time. It's a bank. Let's just say you think that it, you know, I'm willing to get a, I'm willing to invest in for 6% required rate of return. All right. So let's just say interest rate, risk-free rate is 3%. I need to make an extra 3% above the risk-free rate to invest in the stock for you know, the risk that I'm taking. And then we do need to project future dividends, right? Because that's what we're discounting. And um, here we don't know what the dividends will be in the future, we do have to make an assumption. Um, and with without knowing for sure, you know, we can look at some of our historical data here. And we could see these are the dividends that Goldman has been paying. So 2008, 315, 2019, 415. So that went up 31%. 2020, they increased it by 20 and a half percent, 2021, they increased it by 30%. And then 2022, this is year to date, they've increased it by 44% if we compare it to previous year, you know, same dividends, same dividend previous year. So it's been grown at a pretty healthy rate. The median of all these is 30%, so we take the median average it and give more weight than to the most recent. That seems pretty high though. To grow your dividend 30% year over year over year seems kind of high. I'm just gonna adjust it down 
to just to be more conservative. Okay. So let's just give it a growth rate, a constant growth rate of 15%. Let's say I think 15% is going to be able to grow its dividend year over year for next. And I'm going to set it to five years. Okay. And I'm giving it a constant growth rate. So not a variable, but just constant growth rate year over year, 15% to make it easier for the next five years. So at the end of five years, I need to give it a terminal value, right? So what is what do I think that the stock will be worth at the end of five years? Um, just to make things easier, what, what we're going to do is I'm going to give it a terminal value based on a perpetual growth rate. So I'm going to say at the end of five years, the, di the dividend growth rate is going to drop. And, and I need to figure out, well, what I think it's going to drop to. Typically, you know, people reference what you think the GDP will grow year over year over the long term. So let's say two and a half percent, right? So let's say GDP year over year grows two and a half percent perpetually forever. So Based on that, based on these assumptions, you know, I'm going to say dividend, we start out at $10, $10, which would be based off the last dividend. Next five years, year over year, it's going to grow the dividend at 15% year over year. And I require at least a 6% return, you know, on my, on my, on my invested capital. So recalculate that. So based on that, based on these assumptions, right, our model says that we would be willing to pay as much as $493 for this stock. And right now it's at $335. Okay. And this is this is what it's doing. It's saying that next year's dividend would grow to eleven dollars fifty cents. The year after that it'll go down up to 13 dollars 23 cents 2025 will grow to here 2026 so you could see that the dividend how fast it's grown year over year right compound year over year over year if we take the present value of each dividend right and sum them up that means today we would be willing to pay 64 dollars and 27 cents for for all of these dividend streams all right. Um, and then the terminal value based on a perpetual growth, we we figured would be 429. So if we add these up, we get 430, 493.70. Okay. This is what we think it will be worth in today's uh, dollars. So now let's see if the risk free rate, so the required rate of return, you know, the formula would also take into account what the risk-free rate is, right? Because you need to go above that. So let's say they take the risk-free rate up 1%, right? So right now we're projected to go up, what, three quarters in September, another half in December. I think that's the projection right now. So we're talking about one and a quarter, right? So let's just say they go up one and a quarter. My required rate of return also goes up one and a quarter, right? Because I want to stay above that risk-free rate. So what if I take this up to up 1%, from 6% to 7%, that's what I'm increasing. So right now, this is assuming we're getting a 32% discount, right? What if I just raise my required rate of return by 1%, what would this fall to, right? This valuation, my what I think it will be worth. That's the question. So let's recalculate that. And you see how much it fell by. Now it's only at 12%. If I do 7.5, all of a sudden it's at right where it is. So you see how much taking up the, the risk-free rate just by 1%, you know, one and a half percent in your whatever your required rate of return, if you just move it up in linearly in proportion to it, right? How much that valuation all of a sudden comes down. 
hopefully does does that make sense yeah let us know everyone no questions everyone seems good right. so you could see here right seven and a half maybe require eight percent return so if we have all these other assumptions and we cry an eight percent return all of a sudden it's it's at a premium so i just took it up so i took it up two two percentage points two percentage points so look from six percent at a 32 percent discount two percentage points all of a sudden it's at a premium so that that's why market valuations if you know and and this is assuming you know that higher cost of capital is not going to impact my assumptions on earnings growth and dividend growth and margins which i think you'd have to adjust as well right because then how sensitive is earnings growth to higher interest rates and higher cost of capital, right? So then you would have to create those models as well. And you could see that these valuations, how fast they could come down if the that risk-free rate continues to go up. Um, so if there are no questions, Will, and it's Friday, and I have to actually go and renew my license today. Uh -oh. um, because it's expiring next week. So if there are no questions, I think I'll just end it right there. No no questions, D. You have to go okay. fight the DMV this morning. Is that the deal? Yeah, there's gonna be yeah, I'm gonna have to go there, wait in line. And you know, actually my wife also has to go. We have similar birthdays and we're all it expires, you know, almost at the same time. So we're just gonna go there well, and uh, do get it out of the way. Good luck. It's always an adventure at the DMV. Yep. Last time I was yeah. there was uh, quite an experience. But thanks so much, D. Bringing it every day. Uh, have a good okay. Friday, a good trading day. Uh, thanks, everyone. Right. We will see you Monday. All right. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Stay safe out there. Have a great trading day. Yep. Hope to see you guys next week. Trade in peace.